Hey guys, welcome to another ride in the struggle bus where every wheel is an empty triangle. We're going to go on a nice gentle ride today. A departure from those other things that really aren't that tricky, but I mean kind of, kind of are a little tricky, right? But today's topic is a pretty easy and straightforward one. And while I don't want to say that's less important than many of the other struggle bus basics videos, this one probably isn't going to win you games by itself, but it's still important and it's something that many people just simply never do in their games. So today we're going to go over counting. We're going to go look at why it's important to count, how you should count areas, when you should count, and how you can efficiently count while you're playing in a game because, you know, in-game time is important. Before we dive in, though, I, I just want to let you know, I, I know you don't count in your games. After this video, though, yeah, you're still probably not going to count that much. If I had to guess what percentage of players below one Don strength regularly count in their games, it would probably be single digits. It's good to know how to do it, though, and there are times where it's pretty important. So let's get to some counting. Let's start with why counting is important, because I know what you're thinking over there. You're going to try to play the best you can no matter what, regardless of who's winning, right? It's not like you're going to count and see who's winning and then go, well, time to play not the best move right now. So how does knowing who's winning actually affect how you should play? Well, I'm glad you asked. There are two main situations where it's really important to know who's winning and by how much. The first and more common of the two is when you're solidly in mid-game and you have the option of reducing your opponent's territory or doing an invasion. You can try to invade, but if you fail and die, you probably lose the game. Or you can just reduce your opponent, which will fully seal off his territory, and there'll be nothing more you can do about it. So which one do you do? Well, to answer that, we have to go to counting. Are you up by 20? Well, if that's the case, just go reduce him. It'll be enough to win. Are you down by 20? Well, then you should probably go invade him because you're not going to win if he gets that full territory. And if the game's pretty close, eh, it's, likely, it's still likely best just to go reduce your opponent. What you don't want to do is try to invade when you're already ahead because it creates an opportunity for your opponent to get back into the game. Sure, if your invasion is successful, you're just going to win. But if your invasion fails and dies, you might no longer be winning. So why take the risk? You were already winning. So let's take a look at an in-game example from a recent game of mine. So here's our first example, and it's White's turn. And wow, does Black have a huge area there? White should probably do something about that. But the question is, just how much does White need to do? Does White have to invade just to have any chance to win this game? Or can he just reduce? Or can he even just continue building what he already has? Because living in that huge area will totally win him the game, but it looks really hard to live in there. But if White's way behind, it's something he should consider. So does White need to play something like A, aiming to live inside, or can he play something much less risky like B, and just be happy with the reduction? The answer, of course, depends on who is winning and by how much. So let's go over how we figured that out. Let's do some counting. So I now have the board marked off with a reasonably accurate estimation of claimed points if white lets black get that whole territory. Backing up a little though, the first thing I want to go over is how to figure out what spaces to include or exclude from your territories when you're estimating them in order to count. The main thing you have to consider when figuring this out is if very normal reductions happens, what is your actual territory? Not what you want it to be, not what it could grow into, what is it actually right now? You might be looking at the bottom left corner and asking, why didn't you mark more of that off for white? Well, it's perfectly reasonable to see a scenario where black plays d2, perhaps white plays this move, and then black plays here. And if we go through what this, what this exchange could look like and ends with, you'll notice that it's very similar to the territory that I had marked off with my estimation. So it's important to consider these reductions when we look at our territory. Going back, you'll notice I did the same thing for the top. I didn't mark off M19 and M18 for white uh, because it's very easy to see if black plays N17 that those points aren't going to be points for white. So we don't want to count them. Basically, you want to pull back your territory one space from your outer stones. A case could actually be made that I've given too much to the bottom left, but it's just an estimation. And if black reduces one side, white likely grows on the other side. But if you wanted to reduce that area even further for your counting, I wouldn't fight you on it. Let's look at another example to go over this concept again. This example is a little trickier to count because there are a lot more unknowns here, but that's something I wanted to go over because it's another important aspect of counting. We can see what we have marked off for points for both players, again, using the same rule where I pull back the territory one space uh, from the border stones. 
the bottom weight territory in particular is tough to count, so it's because it's still so wide open. So I pulled it back an extra row there. Again, we're just looking for an estimation here. And also, again, I, I wouldn't fight you on it if you wanted to, to count even f fewer points there. The trickier part on this board, though, is what do we do with that center area where white has a ton of potential? I have no idea. That's why I just put question marks there. To, to look into that, though, there are two important factors to think about. The first one here is that Black pretty much already has all of his points. He doesn't have much potential on this board, so this is really all he's going to get. White, on the other hand, has a bunch of potential on this board. And so he can certainly grow his territory, especially in the areas marked off with the question marks. So in this situation, for both players, it's really important to be able to count here. Because once we know how many more points Black has than White, we know what Black's goal is and we know what White's goal is. Do not allow White to get more than whatever the difference is. Or if you're white, get more points than whatever that difference is. In this case, black has about 70 points and white has about 45 points with Comey. So black has to stop white from getting 25 more points in the center. If both players count here, both players know what their goal is. How did I actually count black having 70 and white having 45 though? Let's go back to the first game and go over some methods that we can actually use to accurately count. So there are many different ways to actually count, and I'll go over a few of them. But I encourage you to find a method that works for you. Me, I count like a toddler and use my finger and count the spaces. I've, de I've developed a way to do that quickly, though, and I'm pretty efficient with it. And it works for me, but it's something that I had to figure out for myself. The first method is to break the territories down, territories down into rectangles. Like this. Ooh, so pretty. When you break things down into rectangles, they're pretty quick and easy to count. And then you just add all the little numbers together. If you can't do the math in your head, Write it down. No shame. I've totally written down scores on paper while I'm figuring it out. So here for white, he's got 12 and 8 on the bottom, so he's got 20 there. And then on the top, he's got 15, 26, and then 34. And so then when you add Comey there, uh, white gets about 60 points. Black, on the other hand, has 48, and then 62, and then 77. So black has about 17 more points. But white has a bunch of potential on this board. So... This actually isn't looking too bad for white. Another popular method to count is by doing so in pairs. Uh, so for white, the bottom corner would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we just keep on going and marking off all the pairs. And you're still doing a lot of counting this way, but you have to do half the counting, and then at the end you multiply by 2. One benefit of this is when you're counting captured stones, you know, this white stone right here, this is one pair because you get a point for the capture and you get a point for the territory. And so with practice, you can also do this pretty quickly. The final method I'll mention is finding groups of 10 points and counting that way. People who use this method tend to want to be able to count very quickly while not caring as much if they get the exact number. For them, just having an idea of the score is good enough. So let's take a look at how that would be done. So we're gonna be looking for groups of 10 points. And so we've got 10 points here, and that's a 1. And then we've got these 2, which we can group with this, these 9 for another 10. And then we'll have this 9 here, which is close enough to 10, so that's a 10. And then we've got this 6, which we'll group with this 4, and that is another 10. And then we've got this remaining 7, and then these 3, that's another 10. And then about 5 there. So that gives us about 55 plus Comey is going to get us about 61. And comparing that to our other counting methods, that got us 60. We're only off by one point here. Sometimes it's off by more than that, but again, you can do this really quickly, and it gets you a pretty close number. So we're back at the second example, and let's use the three methods to do some counting. So let's start with black, and we'll use the first method, which is rectangles. So we've got 16 by 2 over here, so that's 32 plus these four here is 36, and then plus this eight here is going to be 44, and then this, this seven is going to be 51. And then we've got the 15 here, which is going to bring us to 66, plus the one capture stone, that's 67. So black has a total of 67 here. Looking at white, he has two by eight here, so that's 16, plus four is 20, plus another 16 is 36, plus two is 38 plus the capture is 39 and Comey brings it to around 45. So using this method of counting, we give black 67 and we give white 45. For the second method counting in pairs, we're just gonna count white this time 
uh, to make it a little quicker. But here again, we're just counting with pairs. And so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and a half. So that'll be 39 plus Comey brings us around to 45. So what we had before. For our final method, finding groups of 10, we're also just gonna do white this time. And again, this is just meant to be quick. So here's one, two, three, a little more than a little more than three. So we'll call that around 37 plus Comey is gonna bring you about 43, which is not 45, but it's pretty close to it. So practice these methods and see which one works for you. So a funny thing happened. I wasn't planning on doing any more examples for how to count in this video and was just going to transition here into why counting was important. But in the middle of me doing this video, someone left a comment on another one of my videos asking a question that was directly related to counting. I bring this up to encourage you guys to ask questions and or ask about topics that you'd like to see me go over. Because in this case, I get to directly answer the question in the video, which is pretty cool, huh? So the question is, hello, Gabe. I enjoy your videos and I hope you continue with them. You're just the best, and I plan on naming my firstborn in your honor. Oh, thank you. I have a fairly important question that seems glossed over in most Ocon and IC. How do you all count during the during the game? You say this threat is 30 points and this threat's 15 points, and how do you know that? How do you estimate how much a stone placed is worth? You know, that's a good question. Let's go back to the two main examples from the co-fight video to go over just how I came up with those estimates. So this is one of the example games that I used in the co-threat video. And in that video, I mentioned that this co was worth about 30 points. So in this case, let's count how many points black gets locally if he wins this co and compare that to how many points white gets if he wins the co. So here, black will get the 10 captured stones in, uh, plus their area, which is 20 points. And he'll also get these three points, one, two, three. And he's also gonna get these three points here. And the reason for that is if these stones are dead, he doesn't have to block this off. But if these stones are living, he will have to play these three stones. So that's 26 points that black gets. If white wins the co, he's going to get, he's going to be able to capture this stone and then fill. And so he will get these two areas of territory plus the capture. So he will get three points. So the difference there is 29 points, which is about 30 points. I'm pretty sure the intent of the question, though, wasn't how did I figure out how much the co-fights were worth, but rather how do you figure out how many points a co-threat is worth or just a move in general. And I can speak to how we figure out how many points a co-threat is worth, especially in the context of this co-fight, but I can't really get into how much a move in general uh, is worth, mainly because that's a, a di more difficult topic that would just need a video on its own. But I'll gladly go over a couple examples of how I would determine how many points a specific move is worth. So this co starts, and let's just say for the sake of argument that black answers this, even though it would be a little too small, and white retakes. And now black threatens here, because this is really the, the one that I wanted to go over. And so how do we figure out how many points this move is actually worth? To start, we have to take a look at what does white get if he simply answers the threat? And in this situation, the counting is pretty simple, and we can just make the rectangle, which is one of the methods that we went over. And so in this case, the rectangle is five by six. So there, white is getting 30 points if he answers this. So let's compare that to if instead white captures the co and black answers here. So it's tricky because we have to be able to read out how this would end up. And I don't know exactly how this would end, but I could see this going in a situation where, where white pushes a little bit and then blocks here and, and, and then this happens. And so here we can compare this to what we had before. And so let's take a look at what black gets out of this. Black gets this little area and he'll probably also get this point and this point. So black's gonna end up getting about eight points here as where white, his original rectangle, if you remember, was this. A lot of that is now taken up and he's really only gonna get about, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 of it maybe. So of the 30, he's lost 19 of the points. So white has lost 19 points and black gained around eight. And so that's about a 27 point swing, which is about as big as the co. 
So I guess it actually turns out in this situation, white should actually respond to this code threat and play here because it is big enough to answer. And every situation is going to be different and it requires some level of reading to figure out you know, what you're gaining versus what your opponent's losing and finding the differential and, and figuring out the point value there. And it's not the easiest thing, um, but it is just, it's the next step of counting, right? You are, instead of just counting, you also have to do some reading to figure out what the board's going to look like and then count, which is admittedly considerably tougher, but that is how you go about figuring it out. In this other example from the co-fight video, I said that this co was also worth around 30 points, and here's why. If black wins the co, all those marked spaces are points. The corner on the right side are his no matter what, so they don't go into this calculation. But that bottom area will become completely dame if white lives here. So counting this rectangle, we get four by six, which is 24, and plus these two, which is 26, and then the five captures is 31. And then we have to subtract these two. So it's gonna be 29 points total. And white living again is just gonna deny black points. White's not gonna actually get any points here. So we don't have to add anything to that. So the total points here are 29 points, which is close to 30 points. So that's what goes into figuring out how big an area is when it when there are stones that should be captured. And honestly, it should have been something that I was already intending to go on, going over in this video. So thank you for the again for the comment. I appreciate it. Okay, so now let's get back to why counting is important. Back to the first example. So we now know how to approximate what territories exist on this board and a few ways to count them. And our counting says that black is ahead on board by 17 points. But white has a lot of potential here. So back to the original question that started all this. What does white need to do here? Does he need to do deep invasion or can he just reduce? In this case, white has more than enough potential on the left side to make up a 17 point deficit, especially true if he can build a nice wall while reducing black. So here, white is fine with just playing B. White doesn't need to play the desperate, I think I am losing move at A. Another way to look at this is to, is to draw a border between your opponent's outermost border stones. If you're solidly winning, you can play on the outside of his border. If you're solidly losing, he should probably play on the inside of his border. And if the game is close enough, then playing on the border will be fine. The reason is, if you're ahead, then you're fine with black already getting what his border says he's getting. If you're behind though, you need to push that border in and that requires playing a stone on the inside. So this is the only example I'm gonna to use to go over this. And I'm not gonna go into the actual invasion or where you should play or how you should handle it because that's not the intent of this video. We're just looking at counting. How to, how to invade and, and strategies for that is, is a topic for another video. There's one more topic I wanna to go over and that's how to change your approach to a game that you're playing once you've figured out if you're winning or losing. We've already gone over that if you're winning, you shouldn't do a deep invasion. And the main reason for that is it, it adds more risk than you need for a game that you're already winning. When you're winning a game, you want to keep the game simple and you just want to move the game towards its end. You don't want to introduce complications to the game because if the game gets complicated and you mess it up, all of a sudden your opponent's back in the game. On the flip side of that, if you're losing, you should be looking for ways to complicate the game. If you're losing and the game con continues on peacefully, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose. So the onus is on you to do something about that. Start a fight, cut some groups, make your opponent sweat. One time I was playing a game and one of my teachers was watching me play as I very peacefully lost by 15 points. He pointed out earlier that there was a cut I should have made and I looked at the cut and it looked scary and there was no way I could read it and my intuition just said that it didn't work. And he agreed. He said that he couldn't read it either, but it's better than losing peacefully. And he said that it, that was the type of game where he would make that cut and he would lose or win the game by 50 points as opposed to just rolling over and dying. He was saying that I needed to complicate the game. Go big. Don't let your opponent close everything up nice and pretty if you're losing. If you're losing, there better be some dead stones on the board at the end of the game. Win big or die trying. And I don't mean wait till the very end and try silly invasions when the game's over. That is way too late. You've already done goofed. So with that topic in mind, let's take a look at our second example again. So we're back at this example with a focus on simplifying the game if you're ahead or complicating it if you're behind. 
So we already know that Black's ahead by, by about 22 points and has very little potential on this board. So Black's goal should be to stop White from getting 22 more points and to simplify the game because he is ahead. Sure, Black can invade the top area, but he doesn't need to. And that'll complicate the game, which is the opposite of what Black wants. And I should know because I was Black this game. So I simplified things and went ahead and reduced White's top. And after we go through this exchange, you can see just how simple this game turned into and oh crap, I'm under attack. Man, this game looks messy now. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. I complicated the game and I didn't need to because I was already winning. Going back, what I should have done is just play a nice simple move that is nice and strong, threatens these three stones while also aiming to look and to get into the top. It's not like White has the time to fix his top right now, but I didn't do this. I did that other, other thing and it ended poorly. Here, my goal should have been just simplify this game, bring it to the end, and just rely on the fact that I have more points than White and this will be fine. I'm going to end this video with one more example where I want to show the other end of the spectrum and what to not do there. So here's our last example, and it's going to show what I mean by losing peacefully. So the game's already likely over at this point, but we've all lost enough games from dominant positions like this one to know that this game is far from over. So it's White's turn. What should he do? Who's winning this game and by how much? I'm actually not going to tell the answer to that one. The description of the video has what I think the estimated score is. So pause the video and count it up for yourself and compare it to what my counting was. How close did you get? Now that you know who's winning by how much, what should White be looking to do here? Should he aim to just close this game out and get his win? Or is he losing and he should be looking for ways of complicating this game? And how about Black? Is he looking to simplify or complicate things? Got that all figured out? Well, let's see how this game ended. I'm not going to provide any commentary other than to say nobody complicates this game and it concludes just with a very peaceful end. So let's take a look at that. So I, I think we've seen enough and see that just White had no fight in him here. He just calmly accepted his fate, rolled over, and lost this game. Don't be like White. Don't lose peaceful games. Go out fighting. Well, that's it. Nothing too crazy today. Hopefully you now know how counting can help you and why it's important to know who's winning and by how much. Many times your, your plan should be based on that information, so it's important to know. I've done countless of reviews where I've been asked how I would approach a reduction or an invasion, and I usually start by asking who's winning and by how much. And the answer is, I don't know. And it's hard to form a plan when you don't know what you actually need to do to win. And look, I'm, I'm just as guilty as all of you. I very rarely count. But I know how to, and I know when I'm playing a serious game that, that I absolutely do. Typically, I'll count two to three times during a game. Once will be at the beginning of the mid-game, and then another time kind of in the middle of mid-game, and then one towards the end. Uh, after that, there's really only so much you can do. I mean, it, it's end-game at that point in time, and your moves aren't really going to change too much based on who's winning. But during the mid-game, counting is really important. So do it more. Just stop, take that one minute, and count. I guarantee you it'll be worth the time to do it. For those of you who enjoy this style of how I present information for the game and are looking for reviews and or lessons, uh, I am available. Uh, my information uh, is listed below. Or if you just want to get back to the channel, it's a great way to, to do that as well. Otherwise, uh, thank you for coming out for another ride in the struggle bus where every wheel is an empty triangle. I'll see you guys next time.